Hey everybody, welcome to Sandals Church. My name is Vivi Diaz and I am your online host. And I just wanna say welcome because here at Sandals Church, we are all about this vision of being real. And something we are so excited about is that this vision of being real isn't just for the adults in the room, but if you have kids or maybe you're just a big kid at heart, I would love to invite you to check out our brand new Sandals Church experience for kids at sandalskids.tv. So make sure to check that out because we're so excited and we're also so excited that you chose to join us today. So enjoy the message and have a great day. Good morning, Sandals Church. Good morning. Man, it's so good to be back with you guys. If you're visiting with us, man, I'm so glad you're here. We love you. This is a safe place to be real. We're in this series called Invited, and you're invited to be a part of this this incredible thing that God has invited us into, his love, his heart, his kingdom. And today we're gonna look at uh, just a really, really difficult passage in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, If you're new to Christianity, there's four stories about Jesus. They're called Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and today we're looking at Luke, and Luke is trying to tell us about Jesus. And if you're here today and and you're not a Christian, that's what we wanna do, we wanna tell you about Jesus. And some of you have heard things about Jesus, and and most of it's wrong. And so you need to to learn about Jesus from Jesus. And and I just invite you, listen, some of the things that we're gonna talk about today are challenging, some of them are confusing, but they're all a blessing, and God wants to bless your life, And, and I hope that today you'll let God bless your life as he invites you into his kingdom. So let's pray together. Let me pray over you that you would hear from God today and that he would speak to your heart. Father, we come here today and God, we got a a lot going on. Some of us are in finals. Some of us, Lord, are are battling illness and some of us are in, in relational conflict. God, I pray that just for the next 30 minutes, we could just stop and set those things aside and consider our souls just for 30 minutes. Holy Spirit, give us the attention to do the work that we need to do as you invite us into your presence. Bless this time, God, and bless my words. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Take a look at your notes, and uh, you can just read along. And I I wanna start with, it just says one Sabbath. This is just an average, ordinary, every day in the life of Jesus. You never know what he's gonna do, you never know what he's gonna say, but it's always something amazing. It says when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Now I'm gonna ask the guys, because only the guys will be honest. How many of you have ever been to a party you didn't want to go to? Raise your hands. Come on, look at this. See the hands just jumped up. Jumped up. And the only reason you went is because your wife made you, amen? All right, ladies love the parties. Guys were like, ah. You ever been to a party where you were kind of excited, then you got there and you're like, uh, this is a bad idea. Like none of the sevens came, it's just a bunch of fives. You're like, what's going on? But we've all been at a party where it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, it's weird. And this is one of those parties, you don't wanna come, it's a bunch of lawyers and pastors. And all they wanna do is attack Jesus, that's it. I want you to underline in your notes, it says, everybody was watching him carefully. I wish that you and I could switch places for like a week. I wish you could be me for a week and I could be you and I would just stare at you wherever you go for a week. And so it's, it's, just, it's just, have you ever felt like someone's watching you? Raise your hand if you've ever had that. Okay, that's like my Mondays. That's just, that's just how it is. And it's funny to be watched. And I never know when I'm being watched. Like this is a true story. This woman was looking at me in the airport and I went up and gave her a hug and I said, how long have you been going to sandals? And she said, what sandals? <laughs> I'm gonna take my arm off you now and uh, we're not gonna call the police, amen? <laughs> it was just, it's embarrassing. And so, but here's the truth is we, we all watch people, don't we? Like, I'm gonna confess, Santa's vision is to be real. I can't not look at people when they pass me on the highway. Like, if you pass by me, I gotta see your face. I have to know who is it that is passing me. 
And so I watch. And isn't it awkward when they watch you and you, you, you just connect eyeballs on the highway? You're just like, why do we feel bad? We're both looking. And then you try to act like you weren't looking. I'm a watcher too. I like to watch. But they're all watching Jesus carefully. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna say? What's he gonna do today? What did, what did he do yesterday? And they're watching him. And then you see dot, dot, dot. You see, Jesus, here's the amazing thing about Jesus. Everybody's staring at him, but he's watching out for hurting people. And I can't put the whole story in your notes because it won't fit, but you see the dot, dot, dot. Well, I edited out 12 verses, and let me summarize some of them for you. It says, Jesus noticed that someone had dropsy at the party. And you're like, what's dropsy? Well, we don't use that word anymore because what it used to meant is, is, is that your body was swollen with fluid, either in your feet, in your arms, or your whole body. And back in the old days, they didn't know what ca caused it, they just knew you were swollen. And regardless of the cause, whether it's your heart, your liver, or your kidneys, it's not good. Like if your body is not processing fluid, you're in trouble. Like in, in Christianity, we have a prayer that says, God, thank you for this food. We ask God to bless our food before it comes in. Did you know that Jews have a prayer that blesses, they ask God to bless it when it goes out? Why would you pray that it goes out? Because when it doesn't, what happens? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. And some of you guys pray more than you think when you're on the john. You're like, oh Lord, help me. Get this out. But when it doesn't go out, you're in trouble. When your body doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you're in trouble. And Jesus sees somebody that's in trouble, and so we don't know. It's heart failure, liver failure, kidney failure. But here's, here's the thing. When your body starts swelling and it doesn't process fluid, you're in trouble. And this is, this is near and dear to my heart because my mother-in-law gained 80 pounds of fluid in just a few weeks. Think about that. 80 pounds of fluid inside her, not processing, not coming out. It's going in, it's not coming out. And we found out that she was in stage four liver failure, that she was in kidney failure, and that her spleen was failing. Multiple organ failure. And here's what the hospital said. The hospital said, man, she, she is in dire need of a transplant, and without a transplant, she'll die. Now, here's what you need to know. It's not easy to get a transplant. Okay, it's not like going in and out burger, I'll have number one, number two, number three. Like it's not, it's, it's a big deal. You, you have to go to committee, a committee of people that don't know you, they just know your chart. They don't know your family, they don't know your life, they just know your disease. And a group of doctors, listen, decide your fate, whether or not you're a candidate for an organ, for a shot at life. And they said she's gonna go to committee. The next thing you need to have for a liver transplant is about $600,000. Most of us can't write a check, amen? About $600,000, that's what it costs. All in for a liver transplant. And then here's another thing, you need somebody to die. Right? We don't ever think about that. Somebody has to lose their life to save your life. Because she didn't just need a partial liver transplant, she needed an entire liver transplant. And then you need really smart doctors. Like you don't want your neighbor, I got this. You don't want somebody that's YouTube, did amen? You want the best of the best of the best. You gotta have smart people, you gotta have a lot of money, you gotta have a liver, and you gotta have a committee that says, yeah, we'll heal you. In this story, you know what Jesus says? The Bible says Jesus took the man with dropsy and he healed him, he just did it. No committee, no 600,000, no one had to die, he just healed him at the party. And then he asked the party, is it okay that I did this on the Sabbath? And people aren't sure. Some of you, you're not sure whether or not you should give your life to Jesus. Let me just tell you, the best we have as human beings is committees, lots of money, and hope. Jesus just does it. You can spend a lot of money on your marriage, you can spend a lot of money on your life, or you can just hand it to Jesus and say, Jesus, here, just take this and bless it. And here's the thing, Jesus is inviting you to be blessed. And some of you are like, no, 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 Jesus, I'm gonna live my life my way. And you can, you can go your way, and it's a very, very difficult road. So then after this story, after everybody's offended, he said to the man who invited him, right, you're the guy that's responsible. You brought me to this lame party. 
He says, when you give a dinner or a banquet, he says, don't invite your friends, your brothers, or your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Like, if you're single, listen to me, here's one of the greatest fights, and guys, you, you have no idea if you're a single guy that you're gonna fight about this one day, but you will. And here's what it is, who gets invited to parties? Like, you come up with lists, and her list is always longer than your list. You don't want anybody to come anyways. And so you start, you start arguing, and you get a picture of this when you get married, because you have to make a list, because you have to pay for everybody to eat. Right, some of you are laughing, that's parents. Ha <laughs> we didn't know we had to pay, yeah. And you start deciding, right? You start deciding, who do we really need here? And Jesus says, when you make the list, don't just think about your friends. Don't just think about your family. Don't just think about your relatives or your rich neighbors or the people who are gonna look really cool in your Instagram photo. Right? He says, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. He says, but when you give a feast, when you throw a party, Jesus says, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be what? Blessed. You see, it's the Christmas season where we're supposed to all remember that it's about giving, and what it really turns into is getting. I remember early on when I would go shopping for my wife for Christmas, I always ended up in the men's section. My wife doesn't wear men's clothing. Like, what am I doing? I'm shopping for my wife and I'm in the men's section. Or I'm like at an auto shop. You know, what she needs is some fluid change here. That's what she needs. No, it's just, right? Isn't it amazing how quickly we can make it about us? Jesus says that it's about giving. We need to give. We need to bless. And we need to bless people, those who can't pay us back. We just need to do this. He says, then you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I want you to underline those words, the resurrection of the just, because you need to know this about this party. Half of the people at this party don't believe that there's any life after death. Jesus says there's life after death. What do you believe about life after death? You see, most of us are afraid about de of death. Jesus says, don't be afraid of death. He says, be afraid of what happens after death. Some of you are terrified to die and you've never thought about what happens when you die. What happens when you die? Don't be afraid of death. Jesus says be afraid of the second death. You stand before God and you're judged. There's a resurrection. There's a resurrection. In this passage it says of the just, but in other places Jesus says everybody rises and we're held accountable for how we lived and what we did. Everybody will be raised. And some of you, man, you're fascinated about life after death. You're, you're fascinated about what happens on the other side. Some of the, 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 the most widely sold books in America have to do with life after death. You know, some person had a dream, some person had a vision. A couple of years ago, there was a very, very famous book called Four Minutes in Heaven. New York Times bestseller. Let me ask you a question. If you were planning a trip to Hawaii, who would you ask? Somebody who had a dream about Hawaii? Somebody who spent four minutes in Hawaii? Or would you ask a local for some tips? Jesus Christ is a local from heaven and he has some tips for you on how to live. He knows what the other side is like because he's from the other side and he's trying to get you there. He says, you'll be repaid at the resurrection. I want you to circle that word repaid. You see, a lot of people believe that heaven is a communist socialist paradise, and you need to understand this. Heaven is the dispensation of rewards based upon how you lived in this life. Now, getting into heaven is all about faith in Christ. How you live in heaven is all about how you lived on earth. God's watching. What do you do? How are you gonna handle that? He's watching, and listen to me. I'm living my life based upon this belief. I believe there's something else after life. I am not living to get it all now. I'm living, I'm betting it all on the fact that there is something after life, and it involves Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, I know in whom I've trusted. I've trusted in him, I've believed in him, and I'm following him. I'm going all in with Jesus. I love verse 15. This is how it feels. If you're a teacher, you know how this feels. None of your students get it. It's so exciting when one does. When one of those, one who was there, reclined at the table with him, heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat the bread in the kingdom of God. One guy gets excited. 
It's kind of like Sandals Church. Every now and then you get one amen. <laughs> right? Amen. And everybody else is just like, well, not yet. <laughs> I'm going to reserve that amen to later. One guy, he says, blessed is everyone who will eat the bread in the kingdom of God. And here's where the story shifts. And you got you to pay special attention because he's not just talking about a party at your house. He's not just talking about eating and feeding people. He's talking about eternity. He said to him, once a man gave a great banquet and he invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything's ready. But they all began to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a field. I gotta go out and see it. Who buys property without looking at it first? Right? They got it. You guys are still lost. Who, who buys property without seeing it first? You want to see it first. He's lying. It's a lame excuse. Next. Another person said this. He said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I bought five new cars. I got to go examine them. Please have me excused. Right? I bought a new boat. I got a new condo, I got a new house, I got stuff. And the last one's the worst one. He said, I just married a wife, therefore I cannot come. I guarantee you, ladies, she wants out of the house. She wants to go to the party. Can you believe it? He's blaming on his wife. Guys, we would never go anywhere if we weren't married. I just sit right here in my, my recliner. Right? I don't need to change my location, I just change the channel. It's all lies. It's all lies. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became what? Angry. You see, a lot of you guys have a very, very false picture of God because you've created your own picture of God because you've not read the word of God. You see, a lot of people believe today you can do whatever you want with your life and God will not hold you accountable. We live in a world today that is allergic to accountability. We are allergic to consequence. We don't believe that we're responsible for anything. And God says you're responsible for how you live. And one day he's going to hold you accountable for how you lived. And all your excuses, all your reasons are gonna be laid bare before God. You see, you can convince me. You can, you can manipulate me. You can lie to me. On judgment day, it doesn't work with God because he sees the truth as it is. And the master became angry and he said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets, into the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Here's what Jesus is saying. The important people are too busy for God. So go find the unimportant people and invite them in. Invite the people who are forgotten. Invite the people that nobody notices. Invite the people who feel left out. Invite them and the servant said, sir, what you've commanded has been done. Underline this, but there's still room. There's still room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in. I want you to circle that word compel. It's always interesting. I never thought so many people would have opinions about me, but people have opinions about me. And one of the things I'm criticized for is He's just funny. He's just being funny. He just, he's turned the church into a comedy hour. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to compel you. I'm trying to compel you. I'm trying to get you to laugh. Ha ha ha, and boom. <laughs> That's what I do. I get you, I get you like, oh, this is great. Ah, what happened? Do you know why that is? It's easier to move people from one emotion to another. I don't want church to be the best nap of your week. Right? I want it to be compelling. I want to give you reasons why. So that, and listen to me, if you're a Christian, underline this and never forget this. This is God's heart. My question is, is it your heart? So that my house may be what? Filled. Man, if there's an empty seat next to you, God wants that seat filled. And you know how that seat's gonna be filled when you invite somebody to sit in that seat. 
This is amazing. 90% of Americans don't go to church, and yet 80% of Americans say they'd go if someone invited them. As you drove to church today and you drove by all the people who are going nowhere, doing nothing on a Sunday morning, know this, 80% of Americans said they'd come to church with you if you invited them. Jesus says the master wants us to invite people. Go out into the highways, to the hedges, and compel people to come in so that my house may be full. You know, when I started Sandals Church, the criticism was, it's too small, it's weird, you just look at us. And now the criticism, it's too big. I have to look at you on a screen. Let me tell you something, if Sandals is too big, maybe your heart for Jesus has grown too small. Maybe. Sandals got too big for me a long time ago. But it's not about me. It's about my father in heaven who's got a big house and he wants as many people in it as possible for all eternity. And he's inviting people. He's inviting people. He says, for I tell you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Listen to me very carefully. If you tell God no, he'll take your answer seriously. Jesus said it this way, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Some of you on Judgment Day, you're gonna be like, well, I didn't really mean no. I meant whoa. I knew it was you. You know, Jesus actually tells a story about a guy who sneaks into the party and Jesus points him out and he says, how'd you get in here? And you know what they do? They kick him out. That's what they do, they kick him out. You're not dressed right, that's what he says, out. Whoa. Jesus is inviting me to do a couple things. Number one, to give up some time to gather. Can I just be real with you? This is uncomfortable, but I'm just gonna be real. Human beings have never had as much free time as we do today. Never. Never. Do you know why most Americans worship at 11 o'clock on Sunday? Because they worshiped at 11 o'clock on Sunday because you had to get up at 4 a.m. to do all the chores, do all the work, and then that's how long it took you to get to church. Most of you, all you had to do today was get up. You just had to get up. You didn't milk the cow. You just opened the fridge. You didn't have to chase a chicken. You just pulled out the eggs. We got more free time now than ever, but we got more excuses. You know why? We got more land. We got more things. We got more relationships. We got more family. What if all God does on Judgment Day is hold you accountable for the time that you've wasted? You ever done that? You ever gone to a movie? I always love to do this to my wife. We watch a movie we shouldn't have watched. I was like, this is coming up later. <laughs> the Lord's gonna talk about this two hours and four minutes. Jesus says this, whoever is not with me is what? Against me. And whoever does not gather with me, what? Scatters. You see, right now in your life, you're doing one of two things. You're gathering with God's people or you are scattering God's people. Be very, very careful because your hobby can become your holy thing and then before you know it, you're not only not going to church but you're leading people away from church for that. And here's what I've seen over the years. People can't get done what they're supposed to get done in the six days. The Bible says six days you have for work and whatever you need, and the seventh day is holy and it's for God. And so what people say is I can't get my stuff done in six days, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take away the Lord's day. And it never works. It never helps. Psalms 55 says this, gather to me my what? My faithful ones. My faithful ones. Church needs to be a regular part of your life. We worship a God who gathers. It's what he does. 
And I want you to pray about this next statement. I want you to pray about this. And this is just for you. This is not for anybody else. This is between you and God. But I want you to write this down and pray about it. I cannot believe I have given Jesus all of my life if I won't give him part of my weekends. I cannot believe I've given Jesus all of my life if I won't give him part of my weekends. I mean, God's good. He loves you. He's inviting you to worship and rest. You're like, no, I'll stress out and die early in the name of Jesus. Isn't it interesting? As Americans reject the Sabbath principle and they reject the day of worship, we're more busy, more stressed out, and more tired than we've ever been. For the first time in human, in human history, most people have to take drugs to fall asleep. Most people didn't used to have to do that. You just drop, you just are out. Because you worked hard and you rested hard. And now we can't, we can't do it either right. Next, we gotta give attention to the needs of inviting others. This whole story is about inviting somebody else. One of the scariest things about church is coming by yourself. And if, and if you came by yourself today, praise God for you. Man, I, I'm glad that you're brave. It's so scary to go to a new place. It's so scary to be the only one. It's so scary to feel like you have to sit by yourself and, and not know anybody. And the bigger the church gets, the more likely you are to feel that way. Bring somebody to church with you. They won't go by themselves, but they might come with you. Go out into the streets, go out into the highways, go out into the hedges and compel them. Compel them. Man, we have a Christmas Eve service. Who are you gonna bring with you? I'm gonna invite my next door neighbors. They're Hindu, they're not even Christian. And some of you guys, all you do is invite your Christian friends. Why? They're already saved. Why don't we invite the lost people? Why don't we invite the person that nobody's noticing, that nobody sees? We need to give attention to the need of inviting others. Man, you don't even have to invite them to church. We have this thing called an app, it's free. I was Christmas shopping for my wife this week and the guy was just making short conversation because the computer wasn't working and he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I pastor Sandals Church and he goes, what is that, a resort for Jesus? <laughs> I didn't know about sandals resorts when I started sandals, I was poor. <laughs> right? And I didn't know about that. And all I knew was about Pharaoh's Village in San Bernardino, that's all I knew. He says, what's Sandals Church? And I told him and I said, you should come to church. He said, oh, I can't, I have to work on Sundays. I said, well, you can watch it anytime you want. And I showed him how to download the app. I, sh I walked him through how to watch it and how to, to fill in the sermon notes. And then I showed him, and here's some discussion questions you can go over with your wife afterwards. And he just looked at me and he said, man, I feel like God brought you in the store this day just to get me in church. And then this is what he told me. Then he asked me for prayer. He said, I'm Chinese, and my mom and dad are in Hong Kong right now. He said, can we pray for that? Of course, of course. Of course I can pray for that. I'd be scared to death if my mom and dad were in Hong Kong right now. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? When's the last time you said, hey, come with me? Jesus tells the story in Matthew. He says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. Have you looked around at people lately? They're confused. They're helpless. We had a lot of family fly in to visit my mother-in-law because there was, a, there was a time where we, we didn't know if she was gonna make it and so family was trying to come in to say their goodbyes. It was that dire. My niece flew in from Seattle and we were just doing some small talk in the hospital. And she told me about her flight. She said her flight was delayed, landing in LAX for 35 minutes. For 35 minutes, they just circled around LAX. And I was like, why'd you do that? She said there was a three-year-old on the plane who wouldn't sit in its seatbelt. And I said, well, where were the parents? She said, oh, they were there. I said, were they full size? 
Like, right? You know, like, right? Like, like normal size? Because, right, if you don't know this, parents, you're bigger. And this is what they said. The stewardess came out. The pilot came on. We cannot land the plane until the three-year-old's in the seat. And the parents, the mom, and the dad, two of them, two bigger people, told the flight attendant in front of my niece, what are we going to do? I'll help. <laughs> Listen to me. Here's what the Bible says. When your three-year-old won't do something, boom. <laughs> Put him down. 35 minutes, a mom, a dad. I don't know what to do. Do you know why? They don't worship God. They worship a little God, and it's the devil. <laughs> 35 minutes, 187 people can't land because if we have a three-year-old that's like, no. What are we going to do? Sit on the child. Right, there will be medical personnel to revive the child when we land. <laughs> but we have, parent, we have parents, I don't know what to do. Do you know why? They don't know they're empowered by God. They're confused and helpless and they have a three-year-old running the house. Because they haven't been raised in church. They don't know what the Bible says. They don't worship a big God, they worship a little God. They were confused and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. You know what people are today? They're sheep without a shepherd. Trying to talk to a three-year-old rationally. What are you doing? It's not a human being. It's a terrorist. <laughs> Have you ever tried to reason with a three-year-old? You can see him going crazy as you're talking. He said to the disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. A couple of weeks ago, I, I went out into our children's ministry, and I happened, I'm not kidding you, to go into the three and four-year-old's classroom. There's 40 of them. One took down a whole plane. <laughs> we got 40 of them in there, and they're talking to each other. We can take this church. <laughs> Listen to me. We had two workers. You know why? People didn't show. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. So Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest for workers. And some of you are like, well, I already raised my kids. Yeah, but these are the Lord's kids. These are the Lord's kids, and these parents need help. These parents need help. Because they're going to counselors for help, and some of the counselors are dumber than the parents. <laughs> Just talk and reason with your child. Okay. You know? If your child can't sit, help them. I told my kids, I can do this all day. <laughs> so pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Man, this last one is, is the most challenging. Jesus is challenging us to give financially to help get people into the kingdom. Did you know that it's not just about feeding people food? It's about saving souls. Blessed is the one who eats the bread in the kingdom of God. Do you know what he's talking about? One guy, one guy got it. It's not about a Christmas party. It's about getting people into the party. That's what it's about. And we gotta focus on that and we gotta think about that. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm all for feeding hungry people. I'm all for helping the homeless. But billions of dollars are spent to do that. How much money is being spent to save souls? Not much. Not much. You know what we do every single week at Sentinel's Church? We throw a party. We have a feast. 
Every single week in Sandals Church has 10 campuses all over Southern California and one soon to be in Fresno. Right, Fres, yes. All over, we have all, we throw this huge party, we put it together. Let me ask you this question. Who pays for the food? I'm looking at you. Let me be honest. It takes a person at Sandals Church about five years, five years, from the time they come to get in a group, to serving, to when they start giving regularly. And you know what, that's okay because I care more about your soul than I do your money. But some of you, it's time. It's time for you to start thinking, okay, how, how do I not just come and eat, but how do I come and feed? How do I come and feed? You know, I know a lot of you, you're new to church and that's okay. A lot of people bring their kids in church and we love you and we love your kids. We prefer that you put them in kids' ministry, but you know, a lot of people don't even know we have kids' ministry. And so if your kid has a meltdown or is battling a demon, <laughs> you know, do the exorcism in the lobby, not in here. But what we do is whenever a family member has to, has to take the child out, what we try to do is meet them in the lobby and just show them what we have. And I, I got this feedback from one of our staff members. They, they, they took this mom and dad and, and they took them through and they showed them all of our kids' facilities. And some of you have never been back there. You don't even know where that hallway goes. You're like, what happens back there? <laughs> and so we gave them a tour of our amazing kids' facilities and our amazing kids' programs. And here's what the dad asked. He said, this is amazing. How much does it cost? Do you know why that is? Because we live in a world that charges. We live in a world that charges. Do you know how much we charge? Zero. How many guys, raise your hand if you've ever been to a, a, a basketball game, a football game, or a rock concert and you paid? Raise your hands, okay? And I know that we have some artists in here. Okay, theater. <laughs> right, yeah, all the theater people. I am an expressive. So when you, go to a, when you go to an event that charges, what happens to the ticket prices the closer you get to the front? What happens? Goes up. How much did you pay today? Zero. 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 Man, if we were at the Lakers game, you're on the floor. I'm LeBron James. <laughs> Boom! You're courtside. You're courtside. What do we charge? Nothing. Can you imagine if you went to the Lakers game and LeBron came out and just said, would you just pray about what you give? He's like, I got a Rolls Royce, man. The payment's due. No, they charge up front. You know, at Sandals Church, we do everything for free. But nothing's free. Nothing's free. And so I don't know where you are in the process. Some of you are here today. And you're like, great, they're about money. Nope, we're about you. We want you to eat. But for the person that invited you when the offering goes by, just stare at them. <laughs> I'm hungry. This is... You know, give them your best baby Yoda eyes. Just... <laughs> is the force with you? I don't know. Right? Here's what Jesus says. Whatever you give now, he's gonna bless 100 times, 100 times. But here's the thing, listen to me. He only blesses what we give. He only blesses what we give. And what I wanna encourage you to do is to become a blessing to Sandals Church. Give your time to gather. Give thought and attention to who you're going to invite. And give financially to help feed do you realize this? We had over 10,000 first time visitors to Sandals Church last year. 10,000 <laughs> first time visitors. This is the third year in a row Sandals Church has baptized over 1,000 people. Third year in a row. You know how that happens? We throw a party and we pay for the food. That's what it's about. Just pray about it. Just pray about it. 
right? That's all I'm asking you to do is pray about it. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on out and um, we're gonna have our ushers do their magical thing. You can feel the Holy Spirit as they go by, ushing, just hush. This is so powerful. And again, thank you for all of you who gather. Thank you for all of you who serve and invite. And thank you for all of you who give. There's no Sandals Church without you. It doesn't exist. So let's just go to Lord in prayer and let's ask God to bless this offering and let's ask God to just bless just our church as we continue to throw a party for free for anybody who wants to come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity and the blessing to give. And God, I know that we are at all kinds of different degrees in our faith and our journey. And so God, wherever we are in our journey, I pray, Lord, that we would respond obediently to your call and your invitation. God, you don't ask for what we don't have, but Lord, you ask for what we can give. And I just pray that we would live in obedience and response to that. In Jesus' name, we ask you to bless and multiply this offering so we can reach people and get them into the kingdom of God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Men. I love you, Sandals Church. God bless. Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you. Because when you donate, your money goes to helping us create places where people can be real. So to donate and be a part of how God moves for the vision of being real, make sure to go to donate.se to make a donation today. Have a great week.